Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to do an emulation showcase for the Steam Deck OLED. Now I'm going to play through all the major systems and show you how they perform, and then also I'll give you a couple tips and tricks along the way in case you do want to play some of these games. Now before we get started, I have a couple points. Number one, we'll be playing everything through Emudeck. That's my favorite way of setting up emulation. I have a full written guide as well as video guide for the whole process. I'll leave that all linked down below. Number two, I want to try to show you the vanilla experience. So I'm not going to do any advanced tweaks. So we're not going to mess with the CPU or GPU configuration. I'm not going to install any sort of plugins and we're not going to use cryo utilities. So there is ways to eke out a little bit better performance with some of these systems, but I want to show you what it's going to be like out of the box once you have configured Emudeck. And then finally, we'll take a moment and talk about local multiplayer. So if you wanted to hook this up to a Steam Deck dock and then plug it into a TV and then play with your friends and family, we'll do all of that as well. Anyway, we've got a lot of ground to cover and I'm excited to try out all these games. And so without any further delay, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, like I mentioned in the intro, I do have an Emudeck guide already on my channel, and it's a little bit older, I think I made it about six months ago, but even then, the entire guide still applies today. So if you want to get set up with emulation on a Steam Deck, I recommend checking out that video, which I'll have linked down below. Now one resource I would recommend after you're all set up is to check out the Emudeck wiki page. They've done a lot of work on it over the past year or so, and so it's a really great resource at this point. And I found that even when I have questions about getting set up, they already have an answer here on the page. I would say the most helpful pages have been the ROMs and BIOS cheat sheet. This will walk you through all of the supported systems, which folder to put the games in, and then also what file types are accepted. And they'll also tell you exactly which BIOS files you need to add as well. One of my other favorite parts of this wiki is that they have individual pages for each of the different emulators. So if you're specifically looking how to set up Wii U, you can check out that page. And same thing with, say, something like Nintendo 3DS. And this will help you get pretty far into the weeds, for example, setting up gyroscopic controls and things like that. Anyway, that's all I did in order to get set up and configured. I just followed my own guide with the Steam Deck OLED and then used the wiki page for any other questions that I had. And so let me give you a look at the current setup on my 512 gigabyte OLED Steam Deck. To start, within my SteamOS library, you can see all of my different Steam games. And so this will be your typical experience when it comes to playing computer games on a Steam Deck. And then one of the best tools within Emudeck is that it integrates with something called Steam ROM Manager. And essentially, this will set up shortcuts for your favorite retro games to appear within the SteamOS interface. Now, I've got a lot of games here, about 130 altogether. And it's not just games. I have links to individual emulators if I need to go into the settings. And then also I have some cloud streaming services like Chiaki so I can play PS5. Either way, as you can tell, yeah, I've got a lot of games going on right now, and this is usually more than I would typically have. Generally, if I'm going to put games in SteamOS, it's going to be just my very, very favorites, so the ones that I'm going to be playing the most often. However, I did put a lot more on this front page, mostly because I needed to use them for getting ready for this video. But generally, I do recommend trying to keep this as trim as possible. I think about 50 games has been the sweet spot for me. And then what I like to do is use a different tool to access all of the games that I have stored on my system, because this right here is only going to be kind of a greatest hits collection. So instead what I do is I use a tool called Emulation Station, and this is also installed as part of the Emudeck process. And within here it's listed out every single game that I've added to the system, not just the very favorites that I have within SteamOS. And so the way I see it, I put my very favorites within the SteamOS interface using Steam ROM Manager, and then anytime I feel like just kind of browsing and playing something else, then I'll use Emulation Station. And of course all of this is included in that Emudeck guide that I mentioned previously that'll be linked down below. At the end of the day, this is how I set up my emulation experience. I put the very favorites in the SteamOS interface, but I don't want to put too many because I don't want it to be too cluttered. And then if I ever want to go into the weeds and try something new, then I usually will go into emulation station. Okay, and now before we get into the actual testing, let me show off a couple other elements. Number one, I'll show these statistics here at the top. And really, there's probably only two things you really need to focus on. On the top left will be the frames per second. And then on the top right, you can see the total power draw followed by the remaining battery life. And so in this example here with an NES game, we're pulling around five and a half watts, and that'll give us something around 10 hours of battery life. So be on the lookout for that when I start playing these games. 
and I'll also mention it as we go through. And another thing worth mentioning is that I'm using the EmuDeck presets when it comes to my video resolution. So for example, within RetroArch with the old pixel systems like NES, they do a special trick in order to smooth out the visuals. So what they do is they turn on a video filter called Normal 4X, and they also combine that with something called bilinear filtering. And this is a preset that I've been using for quite some time on my own emulated systems, especially when you have a screen that's not a super high resolution like here on the Steam Deck. So what this does is it blows out the screen to four times the normal size and then shrinks it back down while applying a bilinear filter. And I know that sounds kind of confusing, but essentially what it's doing is it's rebalancing the pixels so that you have a clearer and crisper picture. And the reason why this matters is because you won't be getting pixel distortion. That's when some of the pixels just look a little bit off. And this is something that's really prevalent in lower resolution screens. After all, the Steam Deck resolution is only 800p. And because that doesn't scale perfectly for integer scaling, you do have to do tricks like this. Now, there are other ways to kind of combat this. You can use special shaders or overlays. But for me personally, I found that when combining these filters with an OLED panel, it looks just fine for me. And so even though I am kind of a stickler when it comes to nice square pixels, I don't really mind it on this display with those tricks. Anyway, if you didn't understand any of that, no worries. All I'm really trying to say is that if you're playing an old school game using the EmuDeck configuration, it's going to look good right out of the box. And so that's what we'll be using for all the classic systems that I'll be showing here for the rest of the video. Anyway, we'll start with Nintendo and Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. These are all my favorite systems of all time. And one thing to note about these systems, besides the pixel balance that is happening inherently with an EmuDeck, Another thing to note is the aspect ratio of the Steam Deck display. As you may remember, this is a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, which means it's going to be taller than your typical widescreen 16 by 9. And while that can present some problems when it comes to PC gaming, it's actually really great when it comes to retro game emulation. All these older systems played at a 4 by 3 aspect ratio, which is going to be a lot more narrow than 16 by 9. And thankfully, because 16 by 10 is taller, it's actually going to balance it out a little bit better. And so you can see here that yes, we're getting black bars, on the left and right, this is called pillar boxing, but it's not quite as bad as it would be if we had a 16 by 9 aspect ratio display. In addition, because the OLED Steam Deck has thinner bezels, it's not as prominent as it was originally on the first Steam Deck. And so because we have a larger display with thinner bezels, everything's going to be filled out a lot better and looks more impressive. And then of course, on top of that, we have an OLED panel, which means that everything's going to look really rich and vibrant. And then of course, we have those really deep blacks, which are going to look great here too. And because the CPU is made with a 6 nanometer process, that means it's going to be even more efficient, especially at these lower wattages. And so when you're playing any of these classic games, I would expect anywhere between a 10 and maybe 11 or 12 hour battery life altogether. Another system that looks exceptionally well on the new Steam Deck is going to be Game Boy Advance. This one had a 3x2 aspect ratio, which is going to be a little bit wider than 4x3, but not as wide as 16x9 or 16x10. And so in this example, we actually get it to fill out even more screen than the 4x3 systems. And so if you're a big fan of Game Boy Advance, I think you're really going to love trying to play those games on the Steam Deck OLED. It's really nice to blow up these games into such a large screen, and they scale really well too. Okay, now let's move over to arcade games, and I just want to highlight here that all of these old 80s and 90s classics are going to play just fine. Setting up arcade emulation is a little bit more complicated because you have to make sure that you have the right ROM set that's going to match the core that you're using. But again, all of this is explained really well in the EmuDeck wiki. In terms of performance, I did want to mention that it does play Killer Instinct at full speed. This is one of those games that's surprisingly hard to emulate, so the fact that we're playing it here on the Steam Deck is pretty awesome. Okay, let's move back to the home console system, starting with the 3D era. So we'll start with PlayStation 1 and then work our way up. And as you can imagine, PlayStation is going to work just fine. You can play this at a native resolution like I am right here, or you can even upscale it if you'd like. You also have a couple different options when it comes to emulators. You can either run it through RetroArch like I'm doing right here, or you could also use the standalone Duck Station emulator. You've got a lot of choice when it comes to the system. And yes, these games look and play great. Let's move on to something that's a little bit more taxing. So we're going to do Sega Saturn using the RetroArch Beetle Core. This core really focuses on accuracy, so a lot of these games are going to play really well. But bear in mind, this core does not support upscaling, so you'll have to play everything at a native resolution. For me personally, I prefer that, especially with Sega Saturn. I like those big, chunky pixels. However, fair warning, I was seeing a couple dips in frame rate here and there with the Beetle Core. After all, this is a very demanding emulator. So in that regard, I would say you probably can't use a lot of heavy-duty shaders with Sega Saturn in the Beetle Core, but you could always try a more performance-minded core like Yavasan Shiro, which is going to allow you to play those shaders and still play these games at full speed. Either way, yes, Sega Saturn is going to be fully playable on the Steam Deck OLED. 
Okay, up next we have Nintendo 64, and for this one I am going to upscale it. So we're going to be playing this at a 960p resolution, which is actually the default within the Ambidex settings. So you don't have to configure anything, it's just going to do it on its own. Either way, Nintendo 64 works really well with this configuration. There's going to be a couple like GoldenEye 007 and Conker's Bad for Day, which will get a little bit of a dip here and there. We're talking like down to like 58 frames per second. But I would still say all of these games are going to be fully playable, even at this upscaled resolution. Okay, now let's move over to handheld systems we will start with the Sony PSP, and for these we're going to use a 3x or 720p resolution. And given the fact that PSP was essentially a 16x9 system, 720p is going to be a really good fit. And when it comes to performance, every PSP game you can think of is going to play full speed at 3x resolution. Now it's not going to be quite as sharp as something like the ROG Ally, which has a 1080p screen which can play PSP games at a 4x resolution, but it's still going to look really good on the Steam Deck, especially with the OLED panel. Next we'll move over to Nintendo 3DS, and one thing worth noting right now is the fact that many of these emulators have a quick menu that's activated with the left trackpad. And this will give you the option of doing things like save states or turning on fast forward or even exiting out of the game. And in particular with 3DS, you'll be able to swap out the screen layout. So depending on what game you're playing, you might be able to find something that's a little bit more ideal. For me personally, I found that the default setup works pretty well, but it's always nice to have quick access to an option menu like this. Anyway, in terms of performance, a Nintendo 3DS is going to be defaulted to a 3x resolution, which works really well here. In fact, I wasn't able to find a game that really caused a lot of slowdown. I think everything that I tried was very playable. And I think the Steam Deck's a really great system to emulate 3DS on. Not only is the display nice and big, but it's also a touchscreen, which means we can interact with anything that requires touch. In addition, you can configure this emulator to work with gyroscopic controls as well for the games that support it. Okay, and the final handheld system I wanted to show off is going to be PS Vita. This one we're going to run using the Vita 3K emulator at a native resolution. And I gotta say, the results here are going to be pretty hit and miss. After all, the PS Vita emulator is still new, so I would consider it to be a work in progress. However, I did find a couple games worked okay. Dragon's Crown was actually flawless, 60 frames per second. And then also Wipeout 2048 gave me some pretty good visuals, but had quite a bit of slowdown. Now, unfortunately for most of the other PS Vita games that I tried, they did not work because because of graphical issues. And it didn't matter if it was a lightweight game like Adventure Time or a heavyweight game like Uncharted Golden Abyss. When it comes down to it, I was seeing a lot of rendering and graphical issues that were a lot worse than they were on the Android and Windows version of the same emulator. And again, I think it's just a matter of time that the development needs to catch up. And so if anything, I think this is an emulator we probably need to check in on every once in a while and see if it improves. Okay, next let's move over to Gen 6, starting with the Sega Dreamcast. And this one's going to run at a 720p upscale via Retromark, and absolutely no problem here, all the games are going to run at full speed. And I think that's kind of expected, even though this is technically a Gen 6 system, it kind of emulates more like a Gen 5. In fact, Dreamcast emulation is typically more performant than it is with Sega Saturn. So either way, yes, 100% fully playable here on the Steam Deck. Next, we're going to move over to Nintendo GameCube at a 2x upscale. This is actually still going to be a little bit more than 800p, so it's going to fill out the full resolution of the display. And I'm happy to report here that GameCube emulation has been vastly improved on the Steam Deck since the first time I tried it back last year when the Steam Deck first released. In fact, there were quite a few GameCube games that struggled on the Steam Deck with its default settings, but now you can see that even with an upscaled resolution, we're having absolutely no issue and perfect performance. Not only that, the power demands are relatively low, about 7 watts or lower, which means in terms of battery performance I would expect somewhere between 6 and 8 hours depending on the game that you're playing. And when it comes to Nintendo Wii I saw similar results. So I was able to play most games at a 2x upscale and still the power demands were relatively low. So if anything I would say that if you have a Steam Deck and you tried out GameCube and Wii before and weren't super impressed, I bet you would like it a lot better now. Another system that saw some pretty good improvements is going to be PlayStation 2. Here I'm running everything at a 2.5x upscale. This is also going to be over 800p, so it's going to fill out the screen resolution and then some. And for the vast majority games, these all played at full speed, even the more heavyweight games like Metal Gear Solid 2. And if you combine this with the widescreen patches, it's going to fill out the whole screen and look really sharp. Now there are going to be a couple games where you'll have to drop down the resolution just a little bit, so for example with God of War 2, I dropped it down to a 2x upscale. And this would give me a pretty stable experience. It would dip down below 60 every once in a while, but I would still consider it to be completely playable. So yes, in wrapping up, I would say that GameCube, Wii, and PS2 are all fully playable on the Steam Deck. 
And let's move over to the final Gen 6 system. It's going to be the original Xbox. And the experience with this one was a little bit hit and miss. There were definitely games that played at full speed, like Jet Set Radio Future. And there were other games that got very close, for example, Soul Calibur 2. This one would drop the frame rate every once in a while, and it was definitely something that was tangible. So I wouldn't say it's a perfect Soul Calibur 2 experience, but still pretty great. However, when you get to more heavy duty games, especially those 3D driving games, the experience was very mixed. For example, with Project Gotham Racing, I got an average frame rate about 26 frames per second. Now in this Steam overlay, you can see that it's still saying 60 frames, but right below that I have a couple windows open that are kind of hard to see, but these are the video debug settings. And these will actually show you the true emulated frames per second. And yeah, it's hovering around 26 to 30. So this game plays super slow, it's about at half speed and definitely not worth it. Other games like Forza Motorsport also played slow, but then had a lot of graphical issues. So this one I would consider to be unplayable. Not only that, the power demands on the Xbox emulator are pretty high. We're getting an average of about 15 or 16 watts, which means you'll probably get around three, maybe three and a half hours of gameplay compared to the others, which will give you about double. Anyway, that's it for Xbox. Let's move over to Nintendo Wii U. Now this one actually performs a lot better. In fact, most games are going to play perfectly fine. We'll start with Legend of Zelda Wind Waker HD. This one had a native 1080p resolution. And even though that's a much higher resolution than we actually need with this display, it still looks really good and performs well. Just bear in mind the power demand for Wii U is a little bit higher, so this is also around 15-16 watts, so expect between 3 and 4 hours of gameplay on a single charge. And yes, like I said, all Wii U games are going to play pretty well, especially those that are in the middle or lightweight tier. But of course I always like to test the hardest game possible as well, and for this system it'll be Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Now I do have a couple things going on in the back end. For example, I went into the graphics pack settings and there's an option to adjust the aspect ratio to 16 by 10. And it's also at an 800p resolution, so it's gonna fill out the entire screen at the perfect resolution for this display. And so there are a couple things going on here. I have a target frame rate of 40 frames per second, but as you can see, it rarely hits that. It's more of an average about 35. That being said, it's still nice and smooth. As long as you're getting over 30 frames per second, it's going to be a great time. However, also bear in mind that this is going to increase the power demand significantly, so it's going to require about 21 watts. And that will drop down your battery life to under 3 hours. I would say between 2.5 and, and 3 hours is probably going to be your best bet. Either way, I think it's going to be a great experience, especially if you're a fan of this game. Okay, next let's move over to PS3. We'll start with our lightweight games and work our way up. And we'll start with a couple PSN games. These are actually some of my favorite to play on the system. So for example, this is going to be games like Afterburner Climax and Outrun Online Arcade. And both of these games will play at 100% speed, absolutely no problem. And the battery life is going to be great when playing these games too. I get about 5-6 to six hours of gameplay. Now moving over to lightweight 3D games like Demon's Souls, these play great too. In fact, this game had an original frame rate of 30 frames per second, but you can apply a patch that'll unlock that frame rate. And so here we're playing at a stable 60 frames per second with the game, so it's actually better than it was originally. I also found that some racing games like Ridge Racer 7 played at full speed, so if you want to play some of these PS3 era titles, you might have some good luck. And then when it came to what I would consider like middleweight games, things like Heavenly Sword, which is a 3D based game but a little bit on the lightweight side, this one I would consider to be playable. It's definitely dipping below 30 frames per second here and there, but the performance is at a point where I would say that I could still play through this game and really enjoy myself. Now it's not all perfect. Perfect. So let me tell you about a couple of the problems that I had when testing out PS3. Number one is that some games just would not actually boot. Dead or Alive 5 is a great example. This would actually start loading up all the shader cache, but once it got to the end it would just get stuck. And I probably tried this five or six different times and probably wasted about two hours trying to get this game running. But in the end I just couldn't get it going. And bear in mind this is the exact same configuration settings that I use with all my other testing. And this is the only system I found where it actually won't boot. So I did find a couple hiccups like that here or there just in trying to get some of these games working. And then finally the other major compromise when it comes to PS3 is that 3D based games that are a little bit more on the heavyweight side just definitely aren't playing at full speed. So for example with Prince of Persia this is one that I would consider to be like in the top 75% of games but not really the hardest ones to run. This one is still struggling even to hit 30 frames per second. And you can definitely feel that slowdown when you're playing the game. So for me personally, I would not consider this game to be playable. And then if we move up to that even higher tier, that's going to include games like Infamous and God of War 3. Yeah, these are definitely not playing at full speed. And so we're definitely seeing a performance limitation when it comes to PlayStation 3 on the Steam Deck. And this is probably the first clear emulation distinction between the Steam Deck and the Legion Go and the ROG Ally. 
because for the latter two handhelds, these games will play just fine. So I would say if you want to stick to the more middleweight games within the PS3 catalog, yes, you can play them on the Steam Deck, but there are definitely some limitations here. Speaking of limitations, let's try out the next system, which is going to be Xbox 360. Now I tried a number of different games here and I couldn't get a single one to actually boot. And this is a well-known issue with Steam Deck and the Xbox 360 emulator, they are just not very compatible. So if anything, I would say don't expect to play Xbox 360 on the Steam Deck, but you might be surprised here and there when a couple games actually play. But at least in my testing with about half a dozen games, I couldn't get any to work. And I did try a bunch of different types of games as well as different configurations, both in SteamOS and in desktop mode, but yeah, nothing really worked. Okay, and the final emulated system I wanted to show off here is going to be Nintendo Switch. And one caveat before we get started, I just wanted to mention here, this isn't meant to be a Nintendo Switch replacement. For me personally, I like to dump my Switch games onto the Steam Deck for a couple reasons. Number one, I prefer to use all those emulation options that we have within Yuzu. So for example, I can adjust things like the anti-aliasing, and then also I can implement things like mods and cheats. And then not only that, I find the Steam Deck controls to be more comfortable to use than the actual Nintendo Switch. And so when I have a choice between the two, I will typically play my Switch games on the Steam Deck and then let the kids use the actual Switch. So let's move into the performance testing of Nintendo Switch games and of note, we are going to be playing everything in handheld mode. It's not going to give us the highest resolution ever, but it's going to be mostly 720p, so it'll look great on the screen. Anyway, when it comes to the more lightweight games, things like Super Mario 3D World, Super Mario RPG, these are going to play great. And as we work our way up to games that are a little bit more demanding, like Mario Kart 8 Deluxe and Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening, we are still getting great performance. For Link's Awakening in particular, there's a lot of shaders that will compile as you're playing the game, so you'll get a couple frame rate dips here and there, but this is one of those games that the longer you play, the better the performance is going to be. And Super Mario Odyssey is very similar in that regard, but a little bit harder to play as well. So this one will get some slowdown, but I would still consider it to be a playable experience. And I would say the experience is very similar with Metroid Prime Remastered. Yes, you'll get some slowdowns here and there, a lot of it has to do with shader compilation, and for me the experience is still good enough to be able to play through the game. Now I've also been playing a lot of Super Mario Bros. Wonder on the Steam Deck and this has been a great experience too, but just like with the others it'll have some slowdown here and there, especially when you're in a new area. But the way I play this game I don't really mind it because I actually like to replay these games over and over, and so yeah the first time might have a few stutters here and there, but the longer you play it the better it'll get. Okay, and finally we have this game, and this one I actually played all the way through on the original Steam Deck, so I'm pretty familiar with the experience. When it comes to playing in both the Sky World as well as in the Underworld, you'll get a pretty solid 30 frames per second. However, once you get to the regular kind of overworld area, especially in the central part of the map when it's got a lot of trees and grass, yes, you'll probably get a little bit of slowdown below 30 frames. Instead, I found the average to be about 25 frames per second. I think it's still very much so playable, and one of my favorite reasons for playing it on the Steam Deck is the ability to implement cheats to just make the game a little bit more playable, at least for me. Either way, I can definitely attest that this game is fully playable all the way through, considering the fact that I beat it on the Steam Deck. Okay, before we start wrapping up, let's talk a little bit about multiplayer. So in this setup right here, I've already paired four different controllers, as you can see on the screen. The yellow and purple controller are going to be paired via Bluetooth, and then the dark red one is actually paired via a 2.4 GHz dongle in the USB connection at the back of my Steam Deck dock. And then finally, the white GameSir controller is plugged into the back of the Steam Deck dock because it's wired. And so I have four different controllers with three types of connection. And if you set everything up in Steam Deck, a lot of these are actually going to work pretty much out of the box. The only thing you may have to do is when you first pair up all these controllers, you're going to need to go into the quick settings menu on the Steam Deck. And then under the settings, there will be an option that says rearrange controller order. And here, if you're not going to be using the actual Steam Deck's controls, you want to move that down to the very bottom. So in this example, I have five different controllers showing up and I want to move the Steam Deck one down to the bottom. That way I have the other four controllers available for play. Now after you've done that, there are going to be some emulators where you'll have to do some specific configurations. For example, within Dolphin, I found that I couldn't get all four controllers to show up without actually doing it manually. And it's pretty easy, you just need to go into Dolphin and then go into the controller settings. And then within here, you can configure each of the four ports. And there's really not that much to do, you just have to choose the correct controller for each player. And the way I like to confirm it is that I will select the controller and then move around the analog stick to find out which one that was. And it's for this reason that 
that I actually recommend using four different types of controllers instead of four of the same controller. And that's because it can get pretty confusing when they're all named the same thing and you're trying to figure out which player is which. Anyway, once you've done that within the Dolphin settings, you should be able to play four player GameCube right out of the box. However, just bear in mind that once you disconnect all of these controllers, you may have to go back into the Dolphin settings and make sure that the Steam Deck controller is your player one. But other than that, it's going to be a pretty seamless experience. Now with the PlayStation 2 emulator, I found it to be a little bit more complex. For example, you have to go into the controller settings and then enable the port 1 multi-tap. I also found that after that, I had a hard time getting all three of the other controllers to actually register. So what I ended up doing is going into the controller settings and then mapping each one of them to each of the players. And this probably took me maybe five minutes altogether to set all four of these controllers up, but after that, everything worked just fine. So if you have a get together or a party at your house and maybe you want all the boys to play NFL Blitz 2003, this will be a great way to do it. Now, thankfully, when it comes to RetroArch based emulation, most of this is gonna be plug and play. So really all you have to do is just connect all the controllers to the Steam Deck and then make sure they're in the right priority order within the Steam Deck settings. And then from there, RetroArch kind of takes care of the rest, especially when it comes to arcade games. It's really fun to play a lot of these four player games like X-Men and Simpsons. And it's pretty awesome that we can do this on the Steam Deck with relatively little issue. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I just wanted to showcase the emulation potential of the Steam Deck OLED. And as you saw, the performance here is pretty incredible. There are definitely still some systems that don't play at 100% speed, but even so, there are tens of thousands of games that you can play on this. And that's not even counting all the PC games that the Steam Deck can run as well. And I think the emulation potential is even better on the Steam Deck OLED because we have that beautiful screen, thinner bezels, and then also longer battery life. And it's for this reason and many others that I consider the Steam Deck OLED to be the best handheld of 2023. Anyway, let me know what you think down in the comments below. Are you playing a lot of emulated games on your Steam Deck or are you actually just playing regular old Steam games? Or if you're emulating games on a different handheld, let me know which one and why. As always, thank you for watching and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.